Okay, so this is my last video on economics. Uh, and in this video, um, you should have already watched the Law of Supply and the Law of Demand video. Um, in this video, we're going to look at a little bit, uh, wrap up um, supply and demand, and then look briefly at macroeconomics and international internet economics and just give you a kind of a quick glimpse at those. You know, basically what we're trying to do here with this week-long look at economics is just give you a taste of what economics is, what economics uh, looks at, some of the different things they look at. So that way, if you're interested, um, you know, you can take economics class when you're a junior or senior and, you know, maybe go into economics field at some point in your life because um, there's tons of jobs in economics out there um, or in economic related fields. Uh, so let's dive in here. Um, with supply and demand, you've been doing what's uh, looking at what's called microeconomics. Um, microeconomics is the study of individual firms and businesses and how they use their scarce resources to satisfy their needs and wants. So microecon, and if you go on to Metro or to UNL or to UNO or any university, they'll have microeconomics courses. And these courses look at, um, at an individual level, individual business, individual person level, uh, how do they make decisions. And in a market economy, they make decisions uh, based upon uh, their own personal needs and wants and their own personal uh, choices. Okay, Macroeconomics we'll talk about a little bit more later in this video. Um, that's looking at like this, the study of economies as a whole, the performance and decision makings of whole economies. So like when the president and Congress make decisions about our economy, about tariffs or about uh, tax cuts or tax increases or about what they're going to do with government money or about how government, uh, excuse me, how economies are doing, like how the U.S. economy is doing or how the Chinese economy is doing. That's called macroeconomics. That's kind of zooming out and looking at a whole country's economics, okay, and how they're uh, doing, what they're producing, and how their country is doing. Uh, international economics uh, looks at the interaction of different countries, interaction of macroeconomies. So the U.S. trading with China, or China trading with the U.S., that's a good example. Okay, so uh, let's move forward here um, with a couple of other things. Uh, within microeconomics, uh, there's a few different markets that uh, microeconomics will look at more specifically. There's a market called monopolistic competition markets. Uh, in, in these kind of markets, uh, which is what what's supply and demand, monopolistic competition markets uh, work really well. Uh, companies sell similar products and they compete with each other for the consumers. So advertising is huge. Think cell phones, think fast food. Uh, those are some really good examples of monopolistic competition markets. Uh, and that's where supply and demand and where they set their prices at really comes into play and where that really matters. Okay, Oligopolistic markets or oligopolies are where there's a few large companies that own most or all of the markets uh, and monopolies are where there's only one company that has complete control of an industry. Um, so those are different markets within um, the United States that you'll see. Uh, a good example of oligopolies are uh, TV providers, although with, with oligopolies, you know, it used to be that you could only get your TV through, say, cable, Cox Cable or Dish Network or DirecTV. But with streaming services, really, you can almost maybe see that monopolistic competition is coming into play there where you have several companies selling similar products. Um, but definitely uh, oil companies are oligopoly. There's only a few companies that sell oil. Uh, but those are just some different uh, forms of markets. Okay. So and, and remember, at any point, if you need to pause and uh, get these into your notes, you can. All right. Uh, I want to jump down and talk real quickly with supply and demand. Um, so you, with your other videos, had went through the law of supply. Supply curve goes up and the law of demand. Demand curve goes down. As prices rise, suppliers want to supply more. As prices rise, uh, consumers demand less. Okay, Their quantity that they demand uh, is so much less. Okay, You're the same way. High prices, hey, I don't want to buy it. Low prices, yeah, I'll buy it. Especially, I remember, high school, 
don't have a lot of money, you are very, very price conscious. Uh, so you can kind of see those uh, how these laws come into play. And Khan Academy does a really good job of explaining those. Now, within economics, they'll actually put the law of supply and the law of demand curve together on a graph. And with this model, they're able to figure out what the price or market equilibrium of a particular product is. Okay, so let me use an example here uh, at, at the store. Okay, so let's say that we go into the store, we have three different prices you could set, a, a company could set their price at. Okay, uh, there is, uh, and let's say we're selling a uh, uh, bananas. Okay, so let's say we're at 20 cents a pound down here, uh, 70 cents a pound or a dollar a pound. Okay. So at 20 cents a pound, uh, suppliers wouldn't really want to sell a lot because the price isn't that high. So if I was a grocery store and I set it at 20 cents a pound, I might be like, yeah, I'm not going to make a lot of money off of selling it for only 20 cents a pound. However, consumers would be like, 20 cents a pound, that's a great deal. And they would really want to buy it there. So what we would see happen at that point is that if the price was set at 20 cents, suppliers, producers won't want to sell a lot, but consumers would want to buy a lot. In that scenario, we would see what's called a shortage because the producers would not be willing to sell as much as what the consumers wanted to purchase. And how this would look on a in a real life scenario is that you go in to buy, you see in the a flyer, bananas 20 cents a pound, you go into the grocery store and you're like, that's a great deal, 20 cents a pound for bananas. You go in, the bananas are all gone because the demand is too much for what the producers can supply. Okay, they're not willing to sell that much; they don't have enough to sell. Okay, you're seeing that right now. You know, at grocery stores with uh, toilet paper, bringing up toilet paper again, right? Or hand sanitizer or soap. Okay, on the flip side, if the producer was like, "Well, shoot, I just got another shipment of ba bananas in," and these bananas, when I put them at 20 cents a pound, I ran out of them because everyone wanted to buy them. I'm going to put them at a buck a pound. So now it's a buck a pound for bananas. Okay, so this PC price up here, buck a pound for bananas. Right? At that price, because the price is higher, my demand curve here, people are not going to want to buy as many bananas. Okay, their demand is going to be significantly less. But I'm going to be like, hey, I'll sell a bunch of bananas at a buck a pound because that's a really good price and I as a producer as a supplier will make a lot of money there okay in that case I will have this gap here between what I want to sell and what consumers want to buy that is called a surplus okay a surplus occurs when producers supply of a good or service exceeds its demand okay so that would be that you know you go in to the grocery store and you see bananas are a buck a pound and you're like Pfft. I'll just go get some apples or some oranges, okay? Uh, those are good substitutes. That's another economic term that if we had more time, we'd go more into. But those are good substitutes for bananas. I don't need to get bananas if they're so expensive. And you would probably see loads of bananas on the banana stand there uh, that weren't being bought. So what the producer would do then in that scenario is, hey, I have all these extra bananas. You know, some people who really like bananas, maybe they're making a banana smoothie and they really wanted it. They bought it, but everyone else didn't. So I have all these extra bananas. I'm going to drop my price. I'm going to drop it down to 70 cents for a pound of bananas. And at that price then, right where these two curves intersect in our model, the law of supply, supply down, demand up, right in the middle there, that market equilibrium is the perfect price where Consumers wanted to buy that product at the price, and producers want to sell the product at that price, and there's no shortage or nor no surplus. That is called market equilibrium in that supply and demand model. And markets will naturally find, with that invisible hand that we talked about in a previous video, markets will find that market equilibrium uh, by setting prices. If I set it too low, and I run out too fast, I know that, okay, next time I sell the product, I got to set the price higher. 
If it goes to, uh, if I have a bunch left over, I know I have to drop the price. Okay, and you see this all the time, you know, in stores when uh, things are on sale or on clearance. That's because the price was set too high to begin with, and so the producer had to drop the price, and they're trying to get rid of all their extra uh, surplus. Okay. Um, one other term with supply and demand uh, that you have to get into your study guide there uh, that we'll go over here real quick is called elasticity. Uh, so within microeconomics, within the study of supply and demand, uh, there's also looking at something called elasticity. So elasticity in economics is how responsive is a person to a change in price. If someone is elastic, it means that they will respond to a change in price. Okay, so. I was just talking about bananas. If all of a sudden you went into the store and bananas were three bucks a pound, you'd be like, no thanks, I'll go get something else. I have a very elastic demand for bananas. If they're too high a price, I'll get something else. Okay. However, if the price was 20 cents a pound, shoot, yeah, I'll get bananas, I'll go ahead and buy them. So people have, uh, if, you have if you are affected by the price of a good, you have an elastic demand for that price. Okay. The term inelastic in an economics means that you're not responsive to the price change. And things uh, that are inelastic uh, are things that don't have good substitutes for them. Um, so medications and drugs and gasoline are good examples. Okay, uh, If we went out today and the price of gas was uh, $10 a gallon, but my car was on empty, I would have an inelastic demand for gas because... Yeah, ten dollars for a gallon of gas is crazy, but my car is on empty and I can't put anything else into my car, so I have to go get gas. Okay, if I'm on a medication that uh, you know uh, prevents me from helps me prevent me from having a heart attack, or if I am a diabetic and I need this insulin medication, uh, even if the price goes up, I still have to buy that despite the fact the price goes up. Okay, uh, lots of uh, you know even. Addictive drugs, uh, you know, look at people who are suffer from drug addiction, uh, it ruins their lives. Um, you know, they're paying all this money towards uh, the drug, and it's no money's going towards food or towards their kids or towards anything else in their life, and it sucks all their money. Uh, but it's because they're addicted to that drug. They have an inelastic demand. Even if the price is high, um, they have to have it because they're addicted. So uh, inelastic means you don't respond to a price change change okay so let's move on here real quick uh, we're gonna talk briefly here about macroeconomics okay I know you've been listening to me a long time I'm sorry uh, but this is kind of the way we're at right uh, so macroeconomics here real fast um, with macroeconomics we're just gonna go through three economic indicators that countries around the world will use to gauge how well their country is doing so first of all, there's what's called gross domestic product, or GDP. You might hear this in the news sometimes, talking about the GDP of the United States went up or went down. Uh, and what GDP is, is it's how much within a calendar year a country has produced and sold uh, in terms of their products. Okay, There's four different categories, consumption, investment, government expenditures, and then net exports, meaning how much have we exported versus how much have we imported. But basically, gross domestic product is a measurement that economists use to see how much our country has produced and sold within a calendar year. Okay? Uh, and they actually break it down by quarter sometimes. And that's what you hear in the news sometimes. They'll say, this quarter, these last three months, GDP has been up or GDP has been down. Okay? Then there's GDP per capita. Uh, GDP per capita is just when if they take the GDP and they divide it uh, and adjust it for the population. And that way they can compare big population countries with small population countries. Because if you just took you know, like the United States and took all of what we made within our country and then you compare it to, say, Switzerland, yeah, we're going to kick Switzerland's butt in terms of total GDP because we're a massive country and Switzerland is a small country. But what if we adjust it for population, GDP per capita, how much are we producing per person? How much is Switzerland producing per person? Uh, it's a way to kind of adjust the figures so that it's easier to compare. And if you go and Google, I'm in a separate tab, Google GDP per capita um, comparison, um, you should be able to find like a way that uh, or organizations that compare 
GDP per capita of the United States to Switzerland to Norway to South Africa to Mexico, etc. Okay, uh, this is part of macroeconomics again. Another thing that macroeconomics looks at is unemployment rate. Okay, uh, so if our GDP is doing well, that's a good indicator that the economy is doing well. But another good indicator of whether the economy is doing well or not is the unemployment rate. Okay, unemployment rate is the number of unemployed people divided by the labor force times 100. Okay, a low unemployment rate means that the country is probably doing a pretty good job because not a lot of people are looking for work. To be considered unemployed, you have to be over the age of 16. You don't you have to have no job at all. You have to be looking for work. Okay, so if you are old and retired. If you're retired and not looking for work, you don't count as unemployed. If you're 15 and looking for a job, don't count as unemployed. You have to be over the age of 16, not have any job at all, so you can't be part-time. You have to be looking for work. Uh, the people who categorize this and study this, um, the Bureau of Economic Analysis um, is the group that usually does this um, for our government. They categorize unemployment into four categories, seasonal, structural, frictional, and cyclical uh, unemployment. Okay. Uh, moving on, one final thing that macroeconomists will look at when they are looking for whether an economy is doing well or not is what's called inflation. So inflation means that prices are rising, that prices are going up. And they, economists want prices to slowly be rising, to be inflating, because that means that demand is good. That means that people have money to spend, and that de they're demanding goods, and when goods are demanded, when goods are in more demand, the prices rise. When goods are not in demand, the prices fall, and that's called deflation if prices across the board fall, and that's not good for the, for the country. So when you hear your grandparents say, you know, back in my day, bread costed 50 cents and gas was a quarter, that's true. But it's not necessarily, a, if it was still that today, that would be a bad thing because that would be an indicator that uh, our economy had not been growing and that prices had not been rising uh, along with that. Okay, So something called the Consumer Price Index is used to measure uh, what the price level of goods in general in the United States are. And it's kind of an amazing thing if you look up Consumer Price Index. They go and they look at things from housing to automobiles, to you know, uh, food and clothes, and they get like this market basket of goods of what an average American would buy, and they price it out and they compare it uh, from what it prices now to what it was in the past, and they see if prices have went up or not. Um, so it's kind of a really some interesting work there. Okay, uh, so that's the third economic indicator that macro uh, economists will look at. Finally, last thing, international economics. There's another branch of economics that looks at international economics. Uh, and the thing that I want to just introduce to you here is uh, with international economics is what's called the exchange rate. So when we go to Mexico or when we go to China or when you go to Canada and you exchange American currency for their currency, uh, that exchange rate is something that international e economists would study. Okay. Exchange rate, what a currency is worth in comparison to another currency. Again, if you Google uh, like the U.S. to Chinese dollar exchange rate or the U.S. to peso exchange rate, U.S. to euro exchange rate, you can actually find in Google uh, what the exchange rate is, meaning that if you went to, say, Mexico and you exchanged one American dollar and said, I want one American dollar's worth of Mexican pesos, you're probably going to get back uh, like, I don't know what the exchange rate is, like 50 pesos or something like that. And on the flip side, if you were from Mexico and you came to the United States and you want to get one American dollar, well, you're probably going to have to give up 50 pesos in order to get one American dollar. So why is that? International economists study that, study these exchange rates and how exchange rates get uh, made. Uh, with exchange rate, there's a term called appreciation, and that means that, uh, like for the United States, that has a strong currency, uh, our, the value of our currency has increased in relation to another currency. Uh, and when you have a strong currency like the United States, like if you looked at the U.S. versus the Mexican peso, our currency, you can get a lot more pesos for one American dollar 
Uh, that's because our goods and our services in America are in demand. That people want the American dollar because with the American dollar they can buy American goods and American services. People don't want the Mexican peso as much because they don't want M Mexican goods or Mexican services. And so that means that our currency has appreciated and is stronger and their currency is uh, depreciated. So if I go to my next one here, uh, depreciation, decreasing the value of a currency in relation to another currency is good. Okay, So a country's currency is not in demand because their goods and services are not in demand. They are using their currency to purchase another country's currency and good. So I want a Mexican good, so I supply U.S. dollars to get pesos. Uh, <clears throat> if your currency is not being demanded, if people don't want your currency, like North Korean currency, people don't want North Korean currency because they don't want to buy North Korean goods, so their currency is severely depreciated or is severely weakened. It's not a strong currency. All right. Same with you know the uh, the Brazilian real versus say the U.S. currency. People want the U.S. currency to buy U.S. goods. Not a lot of people want the Brazilian currency to buy Brazilian goods. And so their currency is depreciated, whereas the United States currency is appreciated. So that's a real quick synopsis of international economics. You should have had enough information now to fill out the rest of your study guide. Thanks for sticking in there with me. Um, you got kind of a whirlwind, hour-long tour here of economics. Hopefully something tripped your trigger. Uh, and even if it didn't trip your trigger, and if you're not really interested in economics, this is some good information that will just help you understand the world better um, in the days, weeks, months, and years to come of your life. All right, that's it for now.